There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Happy New Year and, and welcome back to AGDN. Thank you so much for showing up for our first Lunch and Learn of the year. We're very, very excited to come back together as a group and, and keep collaborating. And what better way to do it than with uh, our guest speaker for today, Steve Yamamori. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, we're excited to learn more about what you do and how we could potentially connect that to the rest of our members. So I'm gonna hand it off to you. Excellent, yes, and I, and I think if it's okay, Anna, um, can we just go around uh, the boxes and, and have people introduce themselves? Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a great idea. Okay, so um, I guess I'll lead it because I can see the boxes. So um, Dan, Danny, do you mind reintroducing yourself? Sure. Um, I think most of you guys know me at this point, but I'm Danny. Uh, I'm the executive director of 33 Buckets. Uh, we're based out of Tempe and working primarily in the Cusco region of Peru at the moment. Uh, so super excited to have Steve here. He's someone that's been a, a mentor to me for a while and super excited that we could get him here to share some of his experiences. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Anna, do you mind reintroducing yourself? First, no problem. My name is Anna Ortiz. I'm the uh, director of the Global Health and Development uh, Program at Esperanza. Esperanza is a global health organization based in Phoenix, and we work in Mozambique, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Peru, Bolivia, and recently in Mexico. Um, and all our work kind of revolves around our bottom line is health, improved health for everyone. And uh, we achieve that through community uh, development projects and um, delivering healthcare services. Um, and we also have a local program that focuses on Maricopa and soon, hopefully California. Uh, so we're also expanding. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a little bit about us. Great, thank you so much. And uh, uh, Sherilyn, Leet. Hi everyone, apologize. I'll be in and out with my video today, but thank you for being here. Um, I'm Sherilyn Lee. I'm the Director of Education and Partnerships for Six Seconds, the Emotional Intelligence Network. And we're a consortium of researchers, educators, um, scholars, practitioners in all fields of study who are trying to, for children, help with social emotional learning development globally. And with adults, um, EQ in business, EQ in the law, EQ in healthcare, you know, as many fields of study as we can, because we feel that our methodology really applies there. So we do projects with UNICEF, World Children's Day, and uh, for we use Fortune 500 company training with EQ to fund all of our humanitarian projects. Wonderful. Thank you, Sherilyn. And uh, Adriana? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm the Global Health and Development Coordinator with Esperanza, and I work very closely with Anna within this program. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Sorensen? Hi, Mark Sorensen. I'm with Hope for Kids International. Uh, our offices are here in Phoenix, um, but we serve in eight different countries. Um, our majority of our work is in Uganda, but uh, also Mexico, Guatemala, um, let's see, um, and others. How about that today? And uh, uh, we focus on child sponsorship. We have about 3,000 kids in our Sponsorship program, we do uh, clean water wells, deep water wells. Um, we did 113 this year. We're just thrilled with the results of that. And uh, we do project or village development. So we build schools and help develop villages. Um, and uh, have had uh, great, have gonna be running five schools this next year. Uh, so very excited about that. So glad to be here. I'm the development director there. Wonderful, nice to meet you. Uh, Paul Strong. Hi, I'm Paul Strong. Um, I am also a co-founder of 33 Buckets. So like Danny said, we're a nonprofit focused on WASH and we work mainly around Cusco, Peru. Um, side note, just a side note too, I'm actually, I'm researching some different masters in international development programs. I'm thinking of joining one. So if anyone here has experience or knowledge of those, I uh, would be happy to connect later. Good plug. Uh, Stacy Moreno. 
Hi, I'm Steve. It's nice to see you again after a while. Um, so I wear two hats. One is because you see it on the screen. I'm, I'm, I'm a social work faculty and staff, a social worker for the community colleges. But um, I'm here in the realm of the Council of International Programs. It's a national nonprofit that was born by um, a social worker um, post-Nazi era as a way to build bridges and community, do community development with uh, between um, post-Nazi Germany and the U.S., and it's evolved, and so I run the Phoenix office, and what we call is building bridges um, between cultures through professional development. So for eight years, I've been taking student groups and professional groups abroad to do comparative learning in social, you know, different civil society fields, and I've been bringing professionals into our community as well, um, and so in that's it, one to six weeks and we work with how we, we develop host families and site visits and internships and to try to get our um, global guests some exposure and connection to the wonderful work that we're doing in the community. Obviously it's been on hold for a while, but um, it seems like I will be getting a postponed group from Armenia. The topic is on domestic violence in the middle of September. So at some point in the summer, as long as it's not postponed again, I'll begin reaching out to see um, how we can pull a program together for the week that they're with us. Wonderful, Stacey. And, and uh, thank you for uh, sharing your second hat that you wear. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'd love to catch up with you with your first hat. So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. that's great. Yeah, uh, we're all wearing multiple hats these days, right? So uh, Marisol Luna. Hi everyone, um, I'm with 33 Buckets. Um, I'm a um, volunteer engineering consultant. Um, been working with them for the past four years since I graduated from school. Um, and currently I'm back in school, so I'm doing a master's in water management and policy um, internationally. So Paul, I've, I applied to many programs in international development, ended up landing in, in the water and policy side, but, um, but can definitely you reach out to me, I can definitely help out with that. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. That's great. Nice to meet you. And uh, um, Mara? Hi, sorry for the background noise. Um, I am also with 33 Buckets. I'm currently serving as a guest fundraising and marketing consultant, but again, many hats. So I'm now helping out a little bit more uh, within 33 Buckets. I'm also just sitting in, um, I'm, I'm lucky to have both work with 33 Buckets and Esperanza, so I'm really happy to see a lot of familiar faces, and I guess just hear from you as well. I've heard great things, Steve. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, Clint Palmer. Hi, I'm Clint. I'm the development manager for Feed My Starving Children. I actually work out of our facility here in Mesa, Arizona. Um, and we're a Christian nonprofit that provides nutritional meals in over 73 countries around the world. Um, so love what we do, but we pa hand pack a lot of that food with our volunteers at eight local facilities. Um, we do some offsite events that we're continuing to try to get back on. And then um, we also use some machine pack to try and meet the need, so. Wonderful, Clint, nice to meet you. Nice well, to meet you. And I think that's it, Is, have I missed anyone? Right, I think that was that was it. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it, um, Danny and uh, Anna. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, you you couched this the, in a great way, Anna, in the fact that this um, to me is a uh, reflection. Uh, I by no means uh, want to to try to pawn myself off as an international development um, expert. Um, I too, uh, like Stacy, wear multiple hats. And so just to give you a little bit of background from me, uh, I am a, uh, I run a nonprofit here locally. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, we are trying to get regionally into the West and Pacific Northwest. And that is the Revley Foundation. And uh, we started the Revley Foundation um, about three years ago. And um, after working in the nonprofit field for uh, 20 to 25 years, um, we realized that there are so many resources out there in the community, uh, at least here locally, um, that uh, the ability to be aware of those resources and to be able to navigate to those resources is very low. And so Revely Foundation uh, was created to be able to train very skilled um, case managers, we call them success workers, 
And uh, we train them to be able to understand not only holistically how to support uh, individuals uh, of lower income, uh, but also how to understand all of the resources to be able to help people succeed. So what we do is we focus on transitioning military veterans and spouses, as well as uh, Native Americans and um, formerly incarcerated. And so what we try to do is, again, understand where somebody is at holistically in their life. Uh, together, we try to build success plans, and then we work with the community of resources to be able to help them succeed, no matter where they're at. So uh, we have found, again, that um, you know, somebody's ideal of what their own success is uh, really varies upon um, you know, what they're looking for in their life. And for some people, it's a five-minute uh, assistance on their um, resume. Uh, for others, it, we could be, and we have been uh, case managing folks for years uh, on end uh, because they are homeless and they have barriers to success and uh, they need employment. And so we will literally work with people um, for years on end, uh, trying to help them navigate themselves through some very confusing and difficult um, big silos, such as the VA uh, administration, uh, the uh, WIOA workforce development, as well as uh, the uh, access uh, uh, Medicaid insurance. So uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea. And uh, we've been working with Stacy at uh, Maricopa the Community Colleges. Uh, we are a field office uh, for um, Arizona State University, as well as uh, University of Southern California, social working colleges. Uh, so we have interns that are getting their master's in social work. Um, uh, um, working with us to be our social workers. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we are now in Oregon and doing the same similar work here in Oregon with the um, Oregon VA. Uh, so that gives you sort of my day-to-day -day hat, but my international uh, development hat, um, we, uh, you know, I was uh, fortunate enough to come from a family that uh, does a lot of that work and is very invested in international development. My father was uh, actually uh, worked for 20 years at Food for the Hungry, which I think is part of the uh, part of the group, which is exciting. And uh, we also have run a family um, global uh, holistic development uh, organization uh, and nonprofit for about 30 years. Uh, so um, during my father's time at Food for the Hungry, uh, he would give me a few books to read, and uh, and every year I would travel with him to the different field offices. Uh, around the world uh, working on that. So that gives you just a little bit of, of information on me. I had the pleasure of uh, being an instructor at uh, Arizona State University with the um, Public Service Academy, and that's where I met uh, Danny. And uh, so again, just to give you a, a brief background on, on me and, uh, and why I'm so passionate, uh, um, because it's truly in our family um, lineage to be able to help um, global services. I will tell you that I'm, I'm currently um, uh, consulting for the Elias Hanna Foundation, uh, which is a uh, local nonprofit that they do uh, work in Syria right now. And Elias Hanna is a um, commercial uh, developer who uh, spends time and in fact is, is in country right now. In Syria, uh, as you know, the civil war is raging on there. And they have hundreds of volunteers uh, doing wonderful work, uh, boots on the ground in uh, northeastern Syria. And so I am super excited uh, to meet all of you. Uh, I am very excited to, to hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, join the group and see uh, and learn from you all on uh, the, you know, how to do the development, how to do the fundraising, how to do some of the um, heavy lifting that you are all doing internationally on a local level. And so it, it was it was in that nature that I um, was working uh, on these reflections that we were having. And and um, so uh, and I know, um, Clint, you're doing great work. And as we were looking at how to localize um, and, and draw awareness locally for your international uh, nonprofits, uh, some reflections kind of came to mind. and. You know, I you know, I don't know if you've been around as long as I have, unfortunately, but uh, I remember that Food for the Hungry used to do their 24-hour uh, relay run for hunger. 
And uh, that was a great way of, of bridging the community involvement into uh, an international scope. And, that, and it was a wonderful way for them to uh, uh, build awareness here locally of what they were doing uh, globally. Uh, Food for the Hungry also uh, had a uh, donated ranch in Carefree where they developed the, um, uh, they called it uh, the Desert Center. And it was an actual uh, research and development opportunity locally that they would be able to work on their different projects, agriculture projects, um, you know, water projects. And, uh, and so it was a great local uh, research and development area uh, for them to bring potential donors to, uh, to bring uh, you know, different uh, uh, fam tours or familiarization tours uh, for different um, national uh, funders. Uh, so th that was sort of what we were uh, thinking about. Um, Feed My Starving Children, I think uh, Clint does an incredible job of being able to work locally um, and build awareness locally for your international um, vision and mission. Um, one of the things I think that you have a unique uh, selling proposition, if you will, from a marketing standpoint, is that you're, you offer the ability to, for kids of all ages uh, to be able to volunteer. And that's something that not many um, organizations offer. Right. And so you're you're bridging the ability to be able to have kids of all ages pitch in and help and build uh, mana packs. Um, and it, it's something that has been wildly successful. And so congratulations on that. So thinking about some of those things, uh, the senior corps uh, through the AmeriCorps program, uh, senior corps uh, and locally here, experience matters. Right. It's it's building uh, seniors that have the experience who may want to continue to serve in their retirement, um, but just don't know how to connect to some of these um, organizations. Uh, there are many um, uh, ex-CEOs and C-suite level folks here in town uh, that are really incredibly interested in international development, and then, uh, but just don't know how to connect into some of those opportunities. So again, understanding some of this stuff, um, you know, with with what we can do, I know Food for the Hungry does um, Christian concerts, there's festivals, there's, you know, there's a lot of these things, unfortunately, that have been uh, kind of put on pause because of the coronavirus. But again, it's, it's how to bridge these local opportunities uh, into um, building awareness and development for the, um, your international mission. And so I would love to get your feedback uh, on some of this. But what I wanted to do is to uh, to kind of share that with you because as we were doing work up at the Navajo Nation, right? The Navajo Nation is the largest uh, Native American reservation by populace and land mass uh, in the country. And uh, they are a few hours from, from you know, doorstep to doorstep and 30% of them have no running water and no electricity. So for the past year and a half, we've been going up to the Navajo Nation, and we have been bringing foodstuffs through uh, USDA. We've been partnering with uh, Swift truck driving, with uh, night transportation. Uh, we've been working with um, other organizations, uh, national organizations such as uh, the Bob Woodruff Foundation, to be able to bring uh, about a thousand food boxes up to the Navajo Nation, and we have uh, reached all four of the five regions to support uh, about 5,000 uh, veteran, Navajo veteran and their families. Uh, but the need there is so great uh, that it really made me think about how can we bridge uh, a, for all intents and purposes, a third world country uh, that are just a few hours from our doorstep and how can uh, potentially international nonprofits uh, partner in with with our native um, you know, families uh, to be able to not only provide great service uh, in these faraway places uh, in our state, but also be able to use those opportunities as a proving ground for the international nonprofits. So again, uh, thinking about that, 
speaking with Danny with 33 Buckets, we were talking about the fact that, um, you know, when 30% of Navajo uh, folks have no running water or electricity, uh, we are talking about potentially trying to build some traditional hogans, which are uh, uh, pentagram um, sided uh, traditional houses that are used for uh, not only housing, but for religious ceremonies. Um, but how can we build some of these that potentially could have a water treatment uh, on the rooftop? And uh, Danny was letting me know that 33 Buckets has some of this technology. And so again, it got me thinking, well, you know, we could be putting storage, uh, battery storage, we could be putting solar storage on there. And for this group of nonprofits, uh, not only again, could it be to be helping um, uh, very uh, underserved folks on the Navajo Nation, but it could potentially also be a research and development opportunity for your nonprofits to be able to do some of these projects, be able to integrate into the community, and then uh, again, show these as examples uh, for potential donors to be able to go and support and identify that, you know, and, and do fam tours up there, you know, for uh, one or two hours, um, which is much uh, more efficient than having to do a fam tour with potential donors out into the um, uh, countries that you are supporting. Um, again, it's a, it's a possible way, uh, you know, having worked for APS, I know that they would not support um, efforts out in the global uh, areas outside of Arizona, but they will support the Navajo Nation. So again, it opens up potential donors uh, and potential development um, within uh, audiences that, that you may not have been able to uh, reach or uh, would not have been aware of the potential for um, doing projects that you're supporting here locally. So that is uh, a lot of what we were talking about. Again, 40% of our Navajo uh, population are on food stamps. Uh, again, um, we are trying to build a food economy out on the Navajo Nation. And, uh, and we actually have a, a USDA um, grant application inside uh, there to be able to uh, work on providing uh, fresh fruit and vegetables uh, at each of the different chapter houses, um, because the Navajo Nation is uh, built into five regions, uh, and each region has chapter houses. So there's 105 chapter houses uh, that really are the uh, hub of the community. Um, so you know we're we're looking at those efforts, and uh, and again, uh, I I'd, I'd love to you know uh, get your thoughts on on how that might um, be uh, a potential partnership with you or um, might be able to be something that you want to look at. Uh, but again, there are there are other areas here locally that reflect uh, you know a very impoverished underserved population uh, that that your organizations might think of being able to partner locally to raise awareness um, to help support what you're doing uh, internationally. Uh, another area of very high need is Guadalupe. Uh, they're on the Tempe, uh, southern Tempe border. Um, I will tell you that this is not a, a new uh, concept. Uh, I do know that um, WorldServe uh, is an international development organization that, uh, as I look them up, they are in fact doing work on the Navajo Nation. Um, and I believe uh, there are others that are, are getting into that area. Um, but again, uh, I think that, you know, as, as we're kind of doing this reflection, uh, the ability for you to just think um, maybe a little bit more cre creatively on how to raise awareness locally of things that you're doing internationally uh, could offer up some potential possibilities. So uh, I know that I, I just wanted to kind of introduce that, and I would love for us to have uh, more of a discussion, uh, and and I, uh, I think you know that's sort of what I'd love to do now is just get get some feedback and and uh, you know help me learn more of what you're doing um, and be able to have a chance uh, for us to have some uh, interaction back and forth. Sounds great. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I have a couple questions to kick off the discussion, if that's okay. 
Um, so could you talk a little bit more about maybe how, what kind of partnerships led you to be able to work in the Navajo Nation? Because I know when the pandemic started, Esperanza looked at the Navajo Nation and was like, well, since we can't go abroad and do our, our surgical and medical work there, could we do it here at home? But one of our big concerns was we don't just want to come in and parachute and do stuff, right? We need to partner with the right people. And that's kind of, that was our biggest roadblock and it never went anywhere because of that, because I'm very aware of, you know, we have to do the right way. We have to be respectful of the culture and their relationships with outside organizations. Um, so I'm curious to, to learn more about how you got in and, and who you're partnering with and how you're able to keep that partnership strong to be able to, to help the communities thrive. That, that's a great question, Anna, and I apologize for not kind of mentioning that because you, you bring up a, almost the other total half of, of what we're trying to do, and that is whether you're into a new community somewhere around the globe or if you're working with uh, Native um, communities or even in Guadalupe, you're right. Um, you have to really build their trust before you're able to get in. And so uh, what we were able to do is uh, we are a, a national affiliate with America Warrior Partnership, and they happen to have a, a affiliate on the Navajo Nation called the Diné Nazpa Partnership, which is the Navajo Warrior Partnership. And so we worked with uh, the Diné Nazpa Partnership and uh, they gave us an introduction into the Navajo Nation's Veterans Administration. And so uh, we started working with them and, and literally all we did, uh, our first one was just get donations from the community uh, and then a Swift Truck uh, donated a 52 foot uh, truck and trailer and driver. And we went up and, and said, where do you need our help? And they said, we could use clothing, water, PPE and um, uh, clothing. And so we, we gathered all that up here locally through churches, through uh, Fry's food stores, through um, uh, Food City. Uh, and then also with the Maricopa Health Department, we got a bunch of PPE together and we just went up there and we went to three chapter houses that, that they said was the most in need. And so we just did that, you know, uh, donated all our time, uh, put that out there. And through that effort, they said, well, gosh, can you, can you do another effort with us? And I said, okay, well, what do you need? And they, and say, so they said, we need the same stuff, but, but more food, more fresh produce, more uh, protein, dairy. So that's when we partnered with the uh, USDA and their food uh, program during COVID. And we were able to uh, box up a thousand food boxes that would last them about a week or so. And we had two trucks go up uh, to the Navajo Nation. And um, we have done that probably, this, this is our fourth time. We're looking to go up to Tuba City here in the first quarter of the year. But honestly, that, that is where we established the trust factor. And uh, through this whole thing, uh, we caught the attention of the president and vice president's office. And they came out and we invited them out uh, to see our, our efforts. Um, and now the vice president is asking us to be more involved uh, with, with further development. Because what we wanna do is, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm probably quoting everybody else, is that our goal is not to just put a Band-Aid on things that are needed on the Navajo Nation. Now we want to take a look at how can we help with the housing? How can we help with more of a water supply? How can we bring sustainability into the Navajo Nation where it's needed? How can we build a food economy uh, to be able to help them uh, with some sustainable economic uh, ways to develop nutritious foods and, and access there? So, you bring up such a great uh, question, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that before. But, and again, I think I think it's as true on the Navajo Nation as it is uh, in Cusco, as it is in Venezuela, as it is in Bolivia. You know, if you are entering a new uh, community, what we try to do is to enter it um, and build that trust, build that relation. We never drop in like you say and 
tell them what they need. We sit back, we listen, and uh, we then try to accommodate what their community needs with what we can offer. And honestly, that's what we're doing in Eugene, Oregon, is, is doing the same thing, right? We know that we want to help the underserved here. I just, I'm not educated enough to understand where we can fit in and be the most beneficial. So th thank you so much for that question, Anne. Any other thoughts or? Yeah, Steve. Um, <clears throat> so I think I have a follow up question for that, just to, to dive a little bit deeper and understand, you know, you say you, you go in and ask, what do you need? Right. And I, I think that's a great place to start. But what does that actually look like? Like, is that a, you know, a, a formal meeting where you, you know, provide individual surveys? Or is this more of an informal conversation? Or like, how does how do you usually facilitate that to you know, achieve the best understanding possible. And I, I wish I could tell you, uh, Danny, that we would that we did qualitative <laughs> and quantitative analysis, yeah. and that we. Um, the truth is, we literally just sat down with the folks that would meet with us, and uh, got their opinion. And uh, you know, working with the Navajo Nation Veterans Administration, uh, you know, the the community uh, is um, both top down and bottom up, right? And so. The top-down approach was the Navajo Nation Veterans Administration. The bottom-up was meeting with some of these chapter house veterans, uh, veterans organizations. Each chapter house has a veterans um, component to them. And so we, we would go and meet with the uh, Navajo Nation Veterans Administration as well as the uh, uh, chapter houses. And then honestly, it was, here's what we offer. Right. Here's here's our strength. And tell us a little bit about how we can marry the strengths with what the needs are. And, um, you know, during COVID, it was very easy. It was like we need these three things and top down and bottom up both agreed. Right. Because there was such a, a massive need. Um, but if you're dealing with a non pandemic community, um, uh, sometimes those needs are very different, right? Uh, from a top-down perspective, they could be telling you one thing. And from a bottom-up standpoint, they could be telling you a, a, something different. So then it's up to yourself to try to figure out like, okay, how am I going to bridge those two areas? And do I have the resources to be able to provide a little bit of both solutions? Or do, you know, or do I, and, it's, and it gets political, uh, you know, it gets... Uh, it gets difficult, um, but what we try to do is, in this case, it was simple. We were able to bridge top down and bottom up. So uh, that's what I would recommend to you. Now, obviously, you can get much more scientific about it and and start, you know, doing surveys. Start and what we what we did do is on our first couple food drives, we had um, some surveying done afterwards. Like, is this what you needed? Uh, you know, was the food uh, helpful? What I will tell you is the first food distribution that we did, um, we learned from the Diné Nazba partnership that traditionally they have what's called a sheep herder special. And a sheep herder special is uh, food, like literally spam, water, uh, beans, flour, uh, um, baking soda, uh, and a few other items that they traditionally used uh, so that they, oh, lard, so they can cook fry bread. Uh, they have meat and, uh, and some kind of, oh, potatoes. And that can last them two or like two to three weeks. And it's, and it's um, traditional that when you come, come to a community and meet somebody, you would have a sheep herder special basket that you would give uh, to families and introduce yourself. So that was a great learning. And so we, we did uh, about three or 400 of those sheep herder specials in boxes. And, 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 and it was a wonderful way for us to be integrated in a way that was traditional. Uh, and I, I feel like that was part of what helped us integrate into the community pretty well. So thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you.
I have a clarification question. Um, because your services uh, are traditionally focused on uh, veterans, when you work with the Navajo Nation, is it the same? Or once you got into the chapter houses, does it become more general support for the community? Well, thank you. That's a good, uh, it's a great question. One of the reasons why we decided to self support um, Navajo during COVID was because the Navajo Nation has, well, and I'm sorry, Native Americans in general had the largest military service of any population in Arizona. Uh, what's more is that uh, Navajo veterans, Native veterans have a higher percentage of combat uh, service than any other population in Arizona. Uh, and uh, there are about 15,000 Navajo veterans uh, on, the, on the nation. So their, their service is high, their combat service is high, and they were one of the hardest hit populations from COVID uh, uh, in the country. And so all of that coming together was something that, that we really thought, well, gosh, we've got to go and help. And I have to tell you, I, uh, we were basing ourselves out of Sholo uh, going on to the nation and they would let us go through roadblocks because of the fact that they were so in need of different um, uh, resources. And the Maricopa County Health Department gave us like hazmat suits and, you know, um, uh, masks and visors and gloves. And I mean, we were all decked out. It was a little, uh, it was a little intense, but for those first few um, trips, uh, we, we, we obviously said, hey, this is the population that is screaming for us to be able to marry our, our mission uh, to the needs that, are, that we see going on. And um, uh, my, my earlier point was the fact that in Sholo, there was such a backup on funerals of Navajo folks that every time we passed the funeral parlor, there was backed up funeral services. Uh, it was, it was an incredible sight to see. Um, so again, it just, reaffirmed the fact of what we were doing is was taking care of a very high need and again sometimes it gets frustrating because you think that you're you know you're throwing a penny into a the grand canyon with with what you're able to do uh but we we can only do what we can do right so um but to your question once we got there if somebody was not a veteran we were we would not turn them away so uh if we had what we needed of course, we would serve the entire community, um, but for Reveille Foundation, uh, being able to support the native veteran population was where we could really focus at and, and hoping that other folks can come and bridge the gap through the, the rest of the entire community. And, and again, if there was a way for us to partner with other organizations to be able to bring the entire community something and we focus on that, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, what I will tell you too is that uh, to Danny's question earlier, we actually uh, got their information. People had to register to get their uh, food boxes. And then we followed up with them to see what, what other areas that they needed assistance with. Did they need to sign up for Veterans uh, Administration? Did they need to sign up for um, access, uh, SNAP, uh, you know, um, food, foodstuffs, SNAP can? Could we interest them in short-term trainings through WIOA? You know, that kind of stuff uh, to, to be able to round that out. And the response rate was not very high. Uh, you know, I think people were just trying to, to, to help, you know, the immediate needs that they have. But at least we knew that we could kind of touch back with them and circle back with them. And I will tell you that the Diné nazba partnership is continuing to reach back out to those families to see like, okay, now you're here, but can we help you in your path to success? So, you know, it was a long answer to your question. No, that's awesome. And it's uh, really exciting to hear that you've been able to reach so many and kind of um, grow your, your services in that way. Cause it, what you did was hard as it is. And then during a pandemic, I, it's just, I'm, 
kudos to you and your team because I, I see that that is extremely difficult and, and the fact that you're still giving back I think is really 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 awesome so I'm, I'm super excited to hear about all of it and, and I'm going to open it up to see if other people have comments or any uh, spurts of inspiration of how you know your individual organizations could potentially partner or collaborate in these efforts I think that would be really awesome too. Yeah, you know what? If I if I could actually ask a question um, to Mr. Palmer, uh, could could Clint? Can you kind of tell us sort of? Um, do you know the vision behind doing the local mana packs? I mean, was there an intentionality there? Uh, because I think, like I said, I think it's it's amazing that you really focused in on the fact that there's not a lot of uh, volunteer opportunities for kids and and families with kids. Uh, you know, really love this idea. And, you know, it's, it's actually a bit surprising that more people aren't doing something like that. But can you tell me sort of the, the you know, the, the generation of that? Sorry if it gets loud in a second. But yeah, so, I mean, the whole volunteer opportunity has become ever so challenging and interesting over the past two years. Um, and I think it's really at the heart of what we do is the serve local impact global type of mentality. Um, and you can make a bigger difference, you know, in, than just here. Um, and I mean, I don't know, I, I just, in, in listening to you and thinking out loud, I know and as a development manager, I always don't have the, the big say at the end of the day, I have to go back to our international department, but I just, I'm intrigued by your service model. And I, I look at like our local, you mentioned the familiarization tours. Um, and I look at some of our current challenges that we face. And I guess I'll, I'll lay out one of them. One of them is, is we used to here in Mesa bring 240 people in at a time, five times a day to come serve with us. Um, we'd have between six and 7,000 people a week come through our doors. Um, we're a little under half that, you know, two years, two plus years into COVID, um, which obviously has its effects of, are we reaching the same people or the same number of people that we used to as an organization to volunteer and create that awareness? Um, at the end of the day, I think that's a little bit hard to measure. Um, but that's where your familiarization tour kind of piques my interest. It piques my interest to ask the question of my international department. And I don't even know if this is something that would even work for the Navajo Nation. But, you know, with previous personal service projects in our family, uh, you know, up on the reservation, it's always intrigued my interest of how could we serve more locally and what effect would that have? Um, I also know that you know, in the state of Arizona, you also have the Arizona state tax credit. So is that a financial benefactor, you know, as well? Because yes, we provide volunteer opportunities in the state of Arizona, but we do not provide any goods or services here in the state of Arizona. So that limits us. So I love the question. Um, not quite sure what to do with that <laughs> as I sit here with it. Um, but I'm sure somebody will get a long email from me today with a bunch of questions and probably not appreciate it and be like, what the heck? Where did he go today to have so many questions? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's just kind of what's sitting on my head right at the very second. I know I, I, I appreciate that Clint, because uh, one of the things that 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 I really wanted to have happen today is just it's just doing doing this right interacting yeah. um I, I don't i don't pretend to be the um, international expert on relief and development um you guys are the experts right I, I i just love the idea of of being in a group of very smart people and um and and just having these conversations you know because uh one of the things clint that I, as you were talking i was like well what if there was a mana pack that was more traditional um ingredients that that was more familiar to 
the Navajo, right? Um, with corn and maize, maize, rice, and you know something like that. Now, I don't know if that manna foodstuffs would would go over well on the Navajo Nation, right? Yeah. But it's definitely something that we could talk to, um, uh, you know, the administration about um, because there is such a there is such a need. And it just, it, to me, it, it makes me wonder, like, wh- how can we fit that need? And, and having, you know, uh, Feed My Starving Children coming to the table to at least ask those uh, or have those conversations is an incredibly um, great opportunity, right? Uh, I will tell you guys this. The Navajo Nation just purchased a building on, I think it's K Street in Washington, D.C. They are building an, an embassy in Washington, D.C., to be able to speak to international uh, issues. And I think it's genius. I mean, I think that is genius because, uh, and I was like, well, you got to help me do some uh, programs out there. Like, let me help you bring people together and talk about this because they are a sovereign nation and they are their own country within themselves. And so why not step on that world stage and and stand up, you know? And so I, I love that idea, but to your point, Clint, it's like, you know, if you could get a Arizona federal tax uh, uh, certification, then could you, and I know that there's some requirements, you have to serve 50% of uh, poverty level uh, folks, but that was what you could do in on the Navajo Nation. Um, you know, could you alter that mana pack? Could you and again, I don't know what this looks like, but could people buy mana packs to then um, assemble uh, at home during COVID? And, and uh, does that make any sense, right? But like, this is exactly what's so exciting about potentially working with you guys is, is to be able to kind of brainstorm different ideas uh, and partner potentially on how to better serve the communities that, that we're at. So thank you. I appreciate that feedback. No, and I and I totally agree, Steve. I think it's just it's important to. That's the part that I think. A, you know, I guess us development people that are on the call, you know, we're charged with paying the grocery bills for sometimes, but yet we love to get ingenious and creative and pose lots of questions. Um, but yeah, so I, I I would love to just hold on to that thought and I don't know Anna if I can reach back out through you or Steve or whatever but just I would love to ask a couple questions I know we're posed up against such huge drastic needs that we currently need to fill Um, but that doesn't always mean there's not room for you know as you said a little R&D or experiment or whatever that we want to throw on top of that you know I think there's always the to try and take a look at that and see what comes out of it. I agree. Uh, and, and Anna, what I what I would love to do is to be able to, um, like I said, hopefully you got my application because I, I would love to jump in, you know, two feet. Uh, I know that uh, I, I'd love to, I'm, I'm loving to work with Danny and, and, uh, and Clint, I just, I appreciate where you're coming from and your perspective um, because I do think that there are ways to integrate locally uh, to better help internationally, and uh, you know, not just Arizona. I mean, I think that there are opportunities um, across the country uh, to just, you know, and and it's the whole: how do you swallow an elephant, right? How do we how do we try to develop and and um, raise all the money that we're supposed to raise to help all the people that we're supposed to help? And it's you know, a bite at a time, right? It's siloing, and maybe maybe the Arizona tax credit's not going to uh, do your entire budget, but maybe it can help you with 25%, right? Or, or whatever that might look like. So, uh, I, I agree with you. And, and yes, I would love to be able to continue to have, um, creative conversations. Yeah. And maybe, you, you know, maybe you have something be successful and then you've demonstrated to every organ, every other nonprofit around, you know, an idea you know, something that's successful and then they start, you know, copying that or implementing that themselves. So 
you know, I think those kind of those kinds of things are just um, to me. That's really where a lot of the potential is. Is that you know, no one, no one can, no organization has the capacity. You can't serve every community yourself. But you're kind of, you know, if you create something that's a model that can be taken up by others, then you know that really helps you, helps things and solutions scale. You know, absolutely, yeah. And and Paul, it's funny because uh, I have told my board. Like, listen, every year I'm going to bring you, you know, 10, 10 ideas. Okay. And four might suck, um, but we will at least give them a try. Uh, but hey, if three turn out really well, then we'll kind of, we'll take those as pilots and develop them further and further. So uh, thanks for sharing that. You know, one of the, one of the terms that comes up when we start talking like this is mission creep. And uh, in a nonprofit organization, um, and that's I've heard that a few times as I brought ideas to the table and said, "How about we do this?" One was uh, a water project in the Navajo Nation, um, and we are, you know, like like Clint said, the need in the places we serve, we aren't even scratching the surface and in, in meeting those needs. So there is plenty of need wherever we're serving, and uh, but Mission Creek gets to be. Um, one of the terms gets kicked around uh, as we do that. Um, however, um, uh, we are all looking for uh, new things to do. And I think one of the leaders in, in innovation is a donor that has a heart for that. Um, if you bring an idea and the funding for that idea, guess what? All of a sudden people are paying attention. And so if, if we can find a donor that says, we really should do this and I believe in it. I'm going to fund it significantly to, so it isn't just the first hundred dollar donation. Um, that'll change the trajectory a, a lot um, as, as an or for an organization. No, Mark, I think, I think you're spot on there. And I, and I do hear that a lot, right? I hear mission creep a lot. And I think that it's, it's always a good devil's advocate. Um, but I also think that it can be um, used to discourage people from trying new things. And so uh, mission creep to me is a little bit of a double-edged sword there. Um, but I, I'll give you an example. So we uh, were working with the Global Aquaculture Alliance. Uh, Danny, I know you've been in contact with those guys because uh, uh, I have a friend over there. And uh, we were talking to the Navajo Nation about could we do a um, aquaculture where we raise trout uh, or fish on the Navajo Nation and be able to sell it internationally to global markets, which could raise uh, you know, funding, that could be workforce development, that could be a sustainable food pro project. And uh, so I was all excited about talking to them and I, and I went and spoke to the administration and they were like, yeah, culturally, um, we really don't eat fish. Uh, we don't really like fish. And so I was like, okay, well, I super struck out there. But, uh, but again, it's, it's like live and learn and, and understand, you know, what might be possible and, and what just, what just is not. Thank you, Steve. This is, um, honestly, the, the whole purpose of this group is to bring groups like this together, organizations, individuals, and hopefully talk about things enough that collaborations just organically start popping up. So I love that you kind of singled out uh, uh, Feed My Starving Children as like, hey, is this even a thing that you would consider? Because I think that's that's really where things start, right? Is pushing the boundaries of what we're already doing, asking the questions that were too um, shy or, or just, you know, challenging to ask and just putting them out there and saying like, why not? Just because it hasn't been done in the past doesn't mean we can't do it in the future. So I, I really appreciate this conversation. I think it's it's getting us all, you know, kind of to think outside of our, our little uh, realm of what our nonprofit does. Um, and that's the whole point of AGDN is, is creating a space for these conversations and then hopefully seeing something flourish out of it. So I'm really grateful that you're pushing our boundaries today. Um, and, and hopefully we can continue these conversations as, as we go forth. And I, I'd love to stay in touch about that as well. Um, so unless someone has a, a closing question or comment, I, I do want to close this out on time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, thank you everyone so much for, for showing up and for um, participating and engaging as you have. 
Bart, do you have something to add? Yeah, just um, Daniel or Paul, I wanted to please send me your contact information. Um, we spoke about 33 buckets today. Um, um, previously, we had a, a large presence in Peru and uh, are considering whether we want to continue go back there. And water treatment was a big piece of that. So if you could send that to me, I'd love to. I passed uh, the city where you do your primary work on to our team, but I'd love to have your contact information too. So. Absolutely. I'll uh, follow up via email. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate you and your time today. Um, I think we've all learned a lot about what you do and hopefully we can stay in touch on that. So with that, um, thank you everyone. And